it's got a lot of constraints on it. Okay, but in principle, you can learn these coordinates and models. Um, you know, we did this on pretty simple systems. I want someone to do this on a high dimensional turbulent fluid flow where you really do need um, a pretty sophisticated network. Okay. Uh, Bethany, this is actually work that came before. This is Bethany Lush, um, who is now um, a scientist at Argonne Labs. This is when she was a postdoc with us. She built a deep autoencoder network to learn Koopman transformations, Koopman eigenfunctions. Okay, so you can basically build a coordinate transformation into a space where your nonlinear dynamics become linear. So you can learn the coordinates and the linear Koopman model. And this is actually something that lots of, of people in the community are doing. This is actually an out of date list. Um, I was at a BAMP workshop in January 2017. Uh, and there we were all working out you know, how machine learning is going to change our field. And one of the things that came out was we know we could do POD with deep learning or uh, neural networks. Can we do DMD? And then very quickly it became obvious that the six groups doing uh, fluids in the audience were all going to go do this independently. And so we all kind of raced for the next six months to try to build these Koopman autoencoders. And there's lots of other groups that have done this for their physics systems, um, a lot of them in fluids, uh, a lot of them in molecular dynamics. But now there's a pretty vibrant community learning these coordinate transformations for their data. And so that's, that's pretty exciting. Okay, um, so that's kind of these coordinate systems and, uh, and representations. I'm going to talk about something that's a little bit outside of my, you know, personal, uh, what, what we do in the lab, but this is something of, of interest to us is this closure problem. So lots of, of us, I mean, how many of you are interested in, in closure modeling? Good, I am too. Um, Closure modeling is a huge deal, right? Like this is the challenge of complexity we talked about. As you crank up your Reynolds number, you have to pay attention to more and more and more scales in space and time, you know, and it's it just gets worse and worse and worse. And so what we would love to do is figure out how to get the effect of scales that we want to neglect in how they uh, how they act on the scales we care about, the large scales. We want to know how the large scales evolve without explicitly modeling the small scales, but including an accounting of them on how they affect the large scales. That's like the most convoluted way of saying that. And here's how you would write it down in math. This is just one way of writing this down in math, um, but this is a nice way, is that you have a really, really, really high dimensional system of equations and everything depends on everything, right? But at some point, I want to just neglect all of these pink variables. They're just, I just don't care about them. I care about how they affect the blue variables, but I can't keep track of all the pink variables. And so what I want to do is I want to find some model of essentially how those high frequencies would depend on the low frequencies and then how the low frequencies depend on the high frequencies and build this model so that basically everything is a function of my large coherent structures. Here, that's what I want. That's the Cindy regression, the Galerkin regression that JC uh, worked on is one possible route, but there's many, many, many possible routes of learning these models, okay? And I'm not gonna talk much about this. This is a vibrant field, lots of groups doing this for LES, for RANs, for, for various types of, of closure modeling. And there's a ton of stuff out there. Um, there's a really great review paper by uh, Durasame, Yakarino, and, and Xiao, um, I think, about two years ago now, where they talk about kind of this field of, of turbulence modeling and closure modeling using machine learning. Um, and there's just such a rich variety of papers uh, on this topic. And I'm, I mean, this is a tiny fraction. These are the ones I've paid attention to recently. Um, the Ling and Templeton work is particularly interesting in my opinion. Uh, so this is a picture from, from Julia Ling's paper, uh, JFM 2016. And essentially what she was able to do was instead of just building a deep, naive neural network, which is what you would do naively, she modified her network structure so that she embedded Galilean invariance into her model. So she, she knew that there was this kind of physical symmetry and she modified her network so that by construction, it was satisfied in the network. And that's the spirit of what we wanna do. I will always prefer these models where a really, really sharp person has put in their physical knowledge, okay? And actually, I think this is a great paper. Um, how many of you have read this paper or seen it? 
Okay, good. So those of you who haven't, this is your required reading. Uh, it's really good. And I believe what they do is they go back to seminal closure modeling work from the 70s. And this is such a good strategy. You should all think about this in your field. You want to go back to the 60s or the 70s or the 50s. There were such brilliant people. And they didn't have TensorFlow. Right? They were not just cranking shit through a neural network. They were really thinking hard about the physics of their problems. And they would derive these beautiful progressions of things that were true until they hit a wall where their mathematical tools were no longer sufficient to go farther. And that's where you get to pick up. That's where Julia Ling picked up. Okay? She found where it was no longer possible to model with the math of the time, and now she has replaced those approximations with better approximations. Okay, you should read this paper, it's really good. Okay, good. Um, so for the last 15 minutes, I'm gonna talk about flow control. I love flow control. So remember, machine learning is not magic, uh, but we wanna control fluids. Um, wouldn't that be cool? All right, so again, this is from uh, the review paper with, with Barrett and me from 2015. Flow control is a really, really hard optimization problem. When I say that we have a non-convex optimization problem, does everyone know what that means? Would anyone like me to say what that means? So a convex optimization problem is easy. It's where there is a smooth mountain with one hump, and all you're trying to do is walk to the top. And how do you do that? What's the, what's the steepest approach to the top of a mountain? You compute the gradient and you go in that direction. Okay? Non-convex optimization is where there are many, many mountains and valleys and I can't even see past my mountain and I have no idea where the global optimum solution is. And I can't just walk uphill because I might reach a suboptimal solution and get stuck there. Okay? It's really hard. And these high dimensional problems have many, many, many local minima and local maxima. It's very complicated. And so there are emerging techniques. Uh, machine learning is really great at non-convex high dimensional optimization. Stochastic gradient descent is really good at this. Neural networks are massively non-convex optimization problems and we're getting really good at finding them. Uh, one approach that I think is really interesting, this is the genetic programming approach um, that, that Barrett has been advocating for a while in experiments is to learn your control law through some kind of a highly expressive function representation algorithm like a genetic uh, programming tree, a function tree. And so the idea here is that it might be very expensive to run simulations of your fluid flow and optimize, but it might be relatively cheap to run an experiment and tell if your control law did a good job. So I think in this mixing layer, this is uh, was Barron's mixing layer uh, in Poitiers where you have a splitter plate that is highly actuated. There's a bunch of pressure ports on the splitter plate and you have a rake of hot wires so you can tell if mixing was enhanced or decreased downstream. I think it only took about 10 or 20 seconds for every control law to tell if it did a good job or not. Like you get a pretty clear signal if mixing went up or down within you know 20 seconds. And that means in an eight hour workday, you can try thousands of these controllers. And so the idea is you start with a bunch of random controllers, you run them, and then you breed the ones that are the most effective. You rank them, and then you do some kind of genetic oper operations to make them better and better. That's a form of non-convex optimization. It's been very powerful. Okay. Um, another optimization I really like, this is work with uh, Ben Strom, who is a PhD student with Brian Palagi and me. This is work in, in Brian's lab where he was trying to optimize the performance of a cross-flow turbine. And a cross-flow turbine is just a vertical axis wind turbine that's knocked on its side and put in a river, okay? Um, and this is kind of a big example of a cross-flow turbine that's gonna go in a river in Alaska. This is a little lab scale device that's about yay big, okay? Um, and so the idea here is you wanna optimize the performance of this turbine to pull the most power out as possible and we've known for a long time in helicopters that one way to do this is to dynamically pitch the blades in advance and retreat, right? That's what you do in a helicopter. Why do we not want to do that in a remote river in Alaska? I always ask my engineers this. 
it's going to break immediately. <laughs> like helicopters have the most maintenance costs. They are constantly being broken down and rebuilt because of these moving parts. Put that in water and it's a disaster, right? So you can't do it. It's a non-starter. And so what Ben realized was that instead of actually pitching the blades dynamically, as you excel, you can accelerate and decelerate this turbine through the different uh, the different phases of its its period, and it gives you the effect of a changing angle of attack because of this rotating frame. And so now this becomes a big optimization problem. He needs to to optimize the rotational acceleration profile as a function of the phase angle to get the most power extraction. You can see here. Uh, this is a good example where he has pulled this large leading edge vortex in the power stroke. And in this case, uh, I think we get 59% power increase over industry standard control. Okay. Um, it's a big optimization problem. It's not a fancy optimization. This is a downhill simplex method. Okay. But it is a data driven iterative uh, optimization technique and you get massive performance bumps with relatively simple optimization. And then you can interpret the output. What's happening is basically it's aligning the formation of this vortex, the kind of maximum torque with the maximum uh, velocity giving you, a, you know, the, uh, at the power stroke. And the follow-on work, just this is not related to machine learning, it's just super cool, and this is something Isabel's working on, is now taking these turbines and figuring out how to pack them densely in an array. Because again, in Alaska, you want to get as much as you can out of the resource you have. So now you're going to put these in an array and you're going to try to have them work together through some uh, coordinated control. And actually, this is a machine learning effort. We need a model for how this affects this. And it's very complicated and nonlinear. Okay, so this is like a Lagrangian coherent structure visualization of the wake of one of these turbines. This is a video uh, Ben Strom made. And so now you have to start thinking about if I was going to put an array of turbines together, where would you want to put them to get a maximal uh, impact? Think about birds in a flock or fish in a school. Okay, that's what we want to do with these. So another area where machine learning is really useful for flow control is in uh, building surrogate models. So this is uh, work with uh, Katarina uh, Beaker and Sebastian Peitz. Uh, and actually I just got an email, this, I think paper was accepted today, so that's good news for us. Uh, basically we're trying to do flow control and flow past a cylinder or flow past the fluidic pinball. So we can rotate these things and we're trying to track a lift profile or a drag profile. Running these full simulations with model predictive control is far too expensive. Model predictive control basically requires you to be able to run a forecast of many, many, many scenarios. I try this control, what happens? I try this control, what happens? At every time step. And that's far too expensive to do with a full fluid model. And so what we can do is instead of running the full MPC controller on my Navy or Stokes solver, we build a deep learning model as a surrogate. It's much faster. It's not as accurate, but it's good enough. Okay, And then we can use that surrogate model to get very accurate control. In this case, we're trying to track the lift coefficient on these three cylinders to be uh, zero for the leading one, plus one for this one, and, and minus one for this one. And within a relatively short amount of time of turning our controller on, we get pretty good tracking performance. Uh, what you can do then is as this evolves and you collect new data, we trained this model for just natural vortex shedding no control, uh, uh, random control. And so we had not seen this solution in our training data. So you turn your controller on and often what happens is you steer your system away from the region where you trained it. But you can use that new data to get better and better and better models and you can get better and better and better tracking if you adaptively update your, your uh, network weights. Okay, uh, there's some kind of interesting follow, not, not follow on work, related work by Erica Kaiser. She basically compared how good model predictive control is with different types of models, Cindy models, neural network models, and DMD with control models. And what's remarkable, this is on a log scale of length of training data, almost immediately within less than 10 data samples, the dynamic mode decomposition with the control model learns enough about, this is a low Lorentz system where linear models suck. DMD with control learns enough about the system for model predictive control to be nearly optimal within less than 10 data snapshots. 
the takeaway here is that DMDC model predictive control is so forgiving, you can often use linear models for very nonlinear systems. I highly recommend trying that before you build a neural network. Okay. Good. A lot of our perception of machine learning in fluids is inspired fundamentally by biology. We observe animals who are expert flow control systems. I mean, these animals have such exquisite capabilities that in many cases go beyond our best engineering attempts. And to our understanding, they do this without knowing the Navier-Stokes equations. They don't have full three-dimensional wake measurements. They're extremely robust to different weather conditions, rain and, and all kinds of things. Moths are particularly interesting. They have a sparse sensor network, a sparse set of strain sensitive neurons distributed on their wings that they use to feel their fluid environment and the strain field that uh, it generates on their wings. And so a lot of uh, learning and flow control in many areas is inspired by biology. We at UW have a new wind tunnel that essentially we can create uh, odor environments upstream of a moth and visual environments. We can measure the full three-dimensional wake downstream using PIV. Uh, one of our colleagues builds little backpacks that go on these moths and tap into their central nervous system so we can see what neurons are firing in their muscles. Very cool. And then we're trying to back out models for how this is a sensory motor processing system, how it's accumulating its information and making flow control decisions. Um, this is work um, by, by Kumit Sakas et al. that I think is really interesting. They're using deep reinforcement learning to figure out how fish can swim and how they can school together and track each other. And there's a whole series of beautiful papers. This is uh, kind of schooling fish or, or, or trailing fish um, using some of these ideas from, from deep reinforcement learning. Um, this is a cool video that I got kind of inspired by Frank Noe. He showed something like this. I mean, just watch these dolphins hunt. Has anyone seen this before? This is pretty cool. So they're really hungry and they're gonna work together and use flow control. Look at, so he's beating his tail, creating this disturbance. And he's gonna trap a school of fish, he or she, I don't know. Okay. And so the fish really don't like being in this uh, enclosed space. And they basically created a feeding pen here. You're gonna see in a minute all the fish jumping out right into their mouths. I mean, this is the kind of out of the box thinking you only get by having a creativity <laughs> that we don't currently have in, in machine learning systems. Okay, um, so the last part of my talk is gonna be completely speculative. So uh, nothing I say here, you shouldn't hold me to anything. There is this massive and interesting trend in, uh, in, in machine learning to build these generative networks. So remember our, our Mona Lisa um, speaking. Can we generate flow fields? Can we generate uh, from a distribution of, of observed flow fields, new, uh, new flow fields that would trick a fluid solver, okay? And I don't know what that'll look like. This is one of my favorites. Um, this is a Google, a deep dream of Archimbaldo's La Primavera. So this was around the same uh, era as Tycho Bray was collecting his astronomical data. Uh, Archimbaldo was an artist with um, Emperor Rudolf II. I think this is actually a picture of Rudolf II, the, the Holy Roman Emperor. And if you think about it, Archimbaldo, this was like the original deep dream. He made pictures of people out of like lettuce and fruits and stuff. That's exactly what deep, mind, deep dream does, is it, it generates representations of images using dogs and cats and other things, peacock feathers. And, and so I think that's kind of interesting. Can we do that with fluids? Can I take my low resolution fluid? Remember that, that picture of the flow past the mountain in Japan? Can I take something low dimensional and paint it with texture, the texture of turbulence in a way that is conservative, that you know, satisfies governing equations, that would trick an expert uh, classifier? 
Okay. I have no idea if that's possible. I know people are working on, on generative fluids. I don't know what they're doing, um, but I'm very interested to see. I think that's going to be uh, neat in the next couple of years. Okay. So with that, um, I'll take some questions and then we can all grab lunch. Thank you. First, thank you for this amazing talk. And I've got a question on extrapolation. Uh, you said that we can't extrapolate. I mean, these systems are really bad at extrapolating, but my question is that in fluid dynamics, this is what we do all the time. Like for example, we take a canonical system like a flat plate and develop a model, and then we use it in an engine or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so we know we are missing somewhat some stuff. And my question is that I get the sense that this is not exactly the same, but how is it not exactly the same? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point that you're absolutely right. We are expert extrapolators. That is our training. We are trained to be expert extrapolators. Uh, and we have, and there's some people are better at extrapolating, some people are, are less skillful at extrapolating. I mean, it's a skill. Um, oftentimes, you resort to things that you know fundamentally are true, right? We know that the Navier Stokes equations will extrapolate and will be useful. We believe that it will be useful even in regions I haven't tested it before. And you have this deep knowledge of the literature and of what people have historically tried and succeeded and tried and failed. And so we are somehow a large interpolation. I, I'm not sure it's as much extrapolation as interpolating the history of all the experiments we've heard of that. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, it, maybe it's philosophical. Does that make any sense? Like you're kind of extrapolating the, interpolating the literature of how things are connected. So how do you use a Reynolds number 100 blade in a compressor, right? Like how could you possibly use that information in this scenario? Well, people have looked at that for a long time. And so we have a lot of information that, that we're collecting. I don't know, that's, that's maybe not the best answer, but. Yeah, so, okay, when something is not well known, Oftentimes, like, okay, so the process of, uh, of conducting a research project oftentimes is not a straight line. It's not like, okay, I want to develop this technology. I'm going to build these pieces and it all works. Usually you have a hypothesis, you collect some data. It doesn't entirely agree with your hypothesis. So you design a new experiment. You run a new experiment to test your new hypothesis and you eventually iterate to something interesting. So that is something that is an active field of machine learning research called active learning uh, and design of experiments. That's kind of the classical, uh, the classical statistics field. And that's something that we can absolutely use uh, right now in, in our, our experiments is some of this active learning. So you make some assumptions of what your model structure is, which is a hypothesis. You collect data it doesn't necessarily agree. And so now you design experiments to maximally refute two equally valid hypotheses. And then you can kind of design experiments. That's what a human expert does. That's well within our grasp in machine learning and it is, is a rapidly developing field. Yep. Maybe I can have a question. Um, You've shown a beautiful example in the case of turbulence modeling where uh, physical ideas have been introduced in the neural network to, to, to do something where let's say humans have, have uh, could not let's say to overcome a limit where humans could that humans could not overcome. Now, yesterday we talked a lot about Koopman, uh, which promises to linearize uh, nonlinear dynamical systems. So possibly even nice stocks. I don't know, uh, but it's extremely hard to derive Koopman functions. So the autoencoders, which are nonlinear mappings, yes. might do what we didn't manage to do. So my question for you, from a perspective point of view. Do you think that uh, they will change the Koopman framework or I think, enable it for fluids, let's say? Yeah, so I think that time delays and autoencoders are the most promising representations for Koopman theory in nonlinear systems that we've found. And I think it's not just us, others have also found this. Um, so I think that's, that's a highly 
kind of promising avenue of research, and it is something that probably scales to more complex systems. So autoencoders are likely to be able to handle more complex systems in that general framework. Now, I am starting to have some kind of philosophical questions about Koopman modeling and Cindy modeling and just dynamical systems modeling in general. So on the one hand, Koopman, you're putting in a tremendous upfront cost to find a coordinate transformation that makes everything simpler forever after. But that upfront cost might be tremendous to find that coordinate transformation. We spent a year optimizing our network for a pretty simple system. Okay, so that's really hard. You're spending all of your effort on coordinates so that your dynamics are simple. On the other side, on the Cindy side, we don't change our coordinates at all, and we're building this you know, fancy optimization to get the dynamics, which might be complicated. The coordinates are simple. I think there's a sweet spot in the middle, and this is kind of what Kathleen's Cindy autoencoder does, where you try to find a relatively simple coordinate transformation that doesn't linearize your dynamics, but it kills as many nonlinear terms as possible. It's like a sweet spot. And for those of you who remember normal form theory, this is how we tackle dynamic, like that's how we, we understand bifurcations is through the normal form. These near identity, simple transformations that sequentially kill nonlinear terms until all that's left is like the skeleton of the nonlinearity that you need. In my mind, that's, that's what's gonna happen. That's what we're doing. Coming back to this question, whether you can extrapolate or not, is it the answer? I mean, I mean, I also wonder myself when, uh, in the research I do, is the answer related to the fact that you made constrain a reduced order model more or less into a physical model so that you can extrapolate and do science exploration with it? Yeah, I mean, I think that your ability to extrapolate is strongly dependent on the assumptions you bake into your model. I think that's absolutely true. Um, I feel much better extrapolating a model, like a Galerkin model that has the physics in it than a neural network model. Um, that's actually why we like these Cindy models because when you only allow yourself to have the fewest terms required to describe the data, generally they generalize better because uh, they're not overfit as much, but that's not always true. Um, but yeah, in, in my experience, the structure of the model and the assumptions you put in and how much, uh, if you bake in energy conservation, you can trust that model a lot more <laughs> than if you don't. Yep. Um, very interesting about you trying to optimize the energy from a uh, water turbine or water-based turbine, but actually from my understanding from industry, the issue is actually the opposite. The issue is that um, they have very nasty gust response and so the question is, have you also tried actually to do the reverse of what you've been trying to do? <laughs> to mitigate the To, to basically extremes. limit the amount of torque which you, the machine uh, experiences. Yeah, so, um, so in a river, it's maybe a little bit less extreme. And in, um, so in the, in the applications that Ben was looking at, I think that's not necessarily as, uh, as important as in wind applications, but, um, so, so Ben's an exceptional engineer and designer, and immediately he saw that one of the problems in this uh, accelerating turbine is that he needed basically like a beefier motor and gearbox. It was going to be more expensive to get those, um, those responses. And so he designed a coupled system so that the power stroke of one coincided with the low spot of another so that they could balance out the load in pairs. And he des designed uh, kind of a custom gearbox for that that was really nice. He has a wind energy startup company um, with, with a colleague uh, who graduated from Stanford. And they're thinking a lot more about kind of the more practical wind concerns. Uh, so they're, they're definitely on it. Yeah, you can check out Xflow Energy. That's what it's called, right? Yep. Other questions? Um, you said that there are certain problems, uh, say for example, the spatially developing mixing layer, where if you train your model on only the initial few snapshots, it won't be able to predict what is happening uh, for the downstream. So, um, but in there are certain kind of turbulent flows in which you have invariants, 
in which the flow further downstream still remembers how it was generated upstream. Sure. So whether these sort of information coupled along with the machine learning can help in regenerate uh, things, like say for example you have Safman invariants or something and yeah. then you couple it along with the machine learning model and try to extrapolate. Yeah, I think invariants are one of the absolute best ways of keeping your machine learning faithful uh, to the physics. There was a really interesting, uh, in the US Navy, there was a multidisciplinary university research initiative, a big research grant um, on trying to extract invariances from ocean flows to improve future prediction. I think this is a really, really great idea that invariance or near invariance are uh, extremely useful in in modeling like that's th those kind of pin our models uh, and I think the more we can learn about invariance the better our models are going to be like absolutely that's a good and, and learning this is a great idea like when you're driving down the road I don't know if this happens to anyone else but sometimes I wake up and I realize I've been spacing out for five minutes like, everyone's done that and none of us have like driven off the road or got, I mean, we're still pretty safe. Why? Because we have an incredible sense of what is normal. And when something is not normal, you immediately put attention on it. You detect it and you focus attention. Our models should be doing that too. And there is an abstract concept of an invariance that goes beyond energy conservation and angular momentum. There are other invariants that we have not written down or given name to, and some of these architectures can start to uncover those invariants. Um, actually, the Koopman Autoencoder Network is an architecture we're using to discover invariants because eigenfunctions with eigenvalue zero are invariants. So yeah, I think it's a really interesting direction. Okay, everyone, we need to eat lunch. Yeah, okay, one more question. Yeah, I have something on the unrelated uh, question to this. So you said that you can use the Cindy network to basically come up with equations uh, using the flow field and uh, these are mostly trained for say dynamical systems. So now suppose if I have mostly say for example from a very engineering perspective I have I have uh, developed some experimental setups at say under very restricted conditions of say Reynolds number, Prandtl number and now I want to scale up this problem to a more real life configuration. So you have, say, for example, rocket engines which are developed in very scaled down versions and then you want to scale it up and now you need some sort of scaling relationships, say geometric scaling and say uh, dynamic uh, scaling, which helps us to scale up these engines. So mm -hmm. whether the Cindy framework can help in sort of coming up with these scaling laws, uh, since these scaling laws are mostly power law monomials and they are yeah. not. So, so scaling in general is quite challenging. Um, I think that when, when Barrett and I were talking about challenges for flow control, like industrial flow control, scaling to industrially relevant flows is one of the biggest, uh, the biggest challenges. Um, and I think every method is going to have a challenge with that. In, in a lot of these algorithms, regression-based algorithms, Cindy algorithms, and so on, you can incorporate as one of your features a parameter that you measure that varies. So I can build that cylinder model with a Reynolds number parameter but my library has to be expressive enough to understand how the Reynolds number comes into that model. And so you absolutely can do it for regions, but it's, it's not obvious, you know, how complex those functions are going to be. So you can just keep on populating the matrix with as many yeah. combination of Reynolds number, Prandtl number, and then different dimensional numbers that you can think, non-dimensional numbers yeah, that absolutely. you can think of, um, and then let Cindy figure out, say, some sort of some sort of scaling relationship. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, so we're actually working on that right now. I guess the scaling is not an easy issue there, no? If you increase too much the... Not at all. I mean, that, that's a huge problem. I don't know how we're going to handle... And, you know, we can do it for small ranges of parameters, large ranges. I mean, it, Feynman said it. How would you ever predict... <laughs> you know, a thunderstorm from the Navy, like, it's, it's a hard problem. Okay, so I propose uh, to close. Thanks. Thank you very Thank much, you. Professor Ruffin. And we can go to lunch. Yeah.